Welcome to the Christian Church on this first day of the week, January the 24th, 2016. I thank God for another opportunity to preach the gospel. I want to get right into things for there's a lot of my mind. We've been talking about a relationship with God through prayer, through humility, through repentance, some people forget about the word repentance and not realize that that is attached to salvation. Yes, you can believe on Jesus Christ, but without repentance, there is no salvation for you. So when those who try to come up with uh, the doctrines that leave things out and want to say we're saved by this alone or that alone, no, you need the whole gospel. You're saved by the whole gospel, and it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses you. He also empowers you to obey him. His blood cleanses you, meaning you're clean. So if you're clean, how can you go back and live dirty and go back to the filthy elements in the world without a terrible price being paid? Because now you're trampling the blood of Christ. True repentance is living a lifestyle of confession before God and obedience to his word. You confess your sins to God. You ask God to forgive you of the sins you committed that you were unaware of. And God's son Jesus Christ, his blood cleanseth us from all unrighteousness and sin you understand if I'm clean I need to be living clean if I'm holy I need to be living holy this is the next step what do I do after I repent from sin what do I do after I made a confession of faith what do I do well it's called obedience so the title of today's sermon will be a relationship with God through obedience. And we're going to find out that Jesus taught obedience. There is no such thing as a disobedient saint. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. You are not a saint if you're disobedient. You have backslidden and gone into hypocrisy. Okay? God is going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That means you've obeyed. There is no faithfulness without obedience. Just like the Bible says that faith without works is dead. The works he's talking about is not your own drawn up works that you've conscripted. But it is the works that God has called you to do. Where Jesus said, he that believes whoever believeth on me, the works that I do, ye shall do and greater works shall ye do because I go to the Father. He's not necessarily talking about miracles and things. What he's talking about is the world will be evangelized because now not only are the Jews accepted, but the Gentiles who will believe on Jesus Christ can also be accepted and repent of their sins as well. So the greater work is the fact that more people can be reached because there's more of us than there was when Jesus was on the earth. There was only one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was in one place at one time. Now that he is that eternal spirit that is sitting at the right hand of God the Father and has been glorified. Now we can have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us who is omnipresent. You understand? So now that we have come to the understanding that we have to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that we have to pray seek his face and turn from our wicked ways that we repent and turn from sin we not only confess sin and ask God to forgive us of our sins but then we go and we do our best to live a life free of the sin that we confess to him with his power you never do it on your own that's why all these people that are saying, oh, you're still a sinner. I've seen a post where somebody said you're a sinner whether you're saved or not. That's a lie from the pit of hell. If you either a saved saint or you're a sinner, there's no in-between. Do you have the capability of sinning? Yes, you do. A sin is a choice. Once you get saved, before you get saved, sin is a reality of your very existence. All you do is sin. As a sinner, you are sinning constantly. When you become a child of God, even though you have the choice to sin or not, to turn from the faith or not, once you become saved, now you have a desire to want to serve God and not serve sin. 
So anytime you find yourself surrendering to sin and the Holy Spirit convicts you, you repent of that sin. If you do not repent of that sin, you will go back into darkness. The spirit will depart and an evil spirit will come and bring seven other spirits more wicked than himself and will enter into you and you will become worse than you were before you first got saved. Do you understand? It says the last state of that man is worse than the be than the beginning. So we have warning after warning in scripture not to play with the grace of God. You understand? This is not fire insurance. This is a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. You understand? If I'm serving Jesus and I'm walking in him and obeying him and trusting him and repenting of sin, I don't ever have to worry about losing my salvation. But if I think that I can smoke and drink and chew and do all the things that I used to do and still be saved, uh, God will turn you over to a reprobate mind if you don't repent and you end up lost and in worse shape than where you were before Jesus found you. Do you understand? That is the true gospel. Anything else is a perverse of the gospel and should be avoided if you are a true Christian. There are many denominations that teach several perversions. There are many perversions, more than I can name without taking up a whole lot of time. But for the sake of understanding, there is only one true gospel. There is only one straight and narrow way that leads to life. And Jesus said there are few that be that will find it. Make sure you are one of the few that find the straight and narrow and stay on it. <clears throat> but before I get into the sermon, we're going to be in Matthew 28 to start. <clears throat> and we may end up somewhere else. We'll see how the Lord leads my heart. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that your spirit will help me to stay focused on the subject and the truth at hand here. That I may stay on course as I preach your word with your help, Holy Father, God, purify my heart from all iniquity and evil, that I may preach the truth of your word from a pure heart. Purify me and those that hear the word of God. I ask, Lord, that your spirit will empower me and use me to teach the truth of your word above my human capabilities. I ask these things in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. 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 Matthew 28, beginning at verse 16. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 16. Let's see what Jesus has to say here. Let me get things uh, properly stated here because I won't be able to move this Bible. Okay. All right. Lord, have mercy on us here. I might have to make a little adjustment. Okay. Lord. Matthew chapter number 28 and verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. People have twisted this verse up in many ways. They don't understand that Jesus said, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. If you do what? If you teach them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. They leave that part out. They just say, Jesus is going to be with you always. Whether you keep the commandments of God or not. Whether you obey the word of God or not. They're saying Jesus is going to be with you always. 
He said, no. He said, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. Now, this is not talking about the Mosaic Law. Because there are 613 different commands. And most people can't remember them, let alone keep them. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments at Sinai in this particular. Even though you know that you can't make idols, you can't use God's name in vain, you can't keep disrespect your parents, you can't covet, lie, kill, commit adultery, and steal. We know that you can't do that. We know that you're commanded to obey God and do good every single day, including the Sabbath. There's no law against doing good on the Sabbath. We know that. But yet people still want to stay in their bondage. You understand? Jesus said, I'll be with you if you teach him to observe what Jesus taught. What did Jesus teach? Except the man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then they twist that and say, oh, well, he must be talking about water baptism because he said, unless a man be born of water. No, he's not talking about water baptism. This is a spiritual passage of scripture here. This is talking about a spiritual rebirth. Just as water, when a woman gives birth, her water breaks. Before she gives birth. Mm -hmm. Water in this particular instance is a symbol of life. Now baptism is a symbol and a representation. But that's not what saves you. Jesus mm -hmm. said baptize them. But he's mm -hmm. talking about baptizing people into discipleship. Okay. While you're on the earth. When you get baptized. You're telling the world. That you want to follow Jesus. Okay. Then you have to live that out. But it is your faith in him. It's your confession of Christ Jesus the Lord. And the belief that God raised him from the dead in your heart. That is what God uses. And he saves you. Through the blood of Christ. You understand. So we can't get caught up and start worshiping the elements. And not worshiping the God of the Bible. Jesus said okay. Teach them. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is after Jesus rose from the dead. So those who want to try to use Acts 2.38 to try to cancel out Matthew 28 and 19, they're operating under the spirit of the Antichrist is what they're doing. Because Matthew's 28.19 and Acts 2.38 actually are talking about the same Lord. Okay? Because they both work together as one it's a unified just like the father son and holy ghost are unified okay the son is jesus so it's not a title it's who he is and you got churches like the paw those apostolic pentecostal churches those anti-trinitarian churches that are operating under the spirit of the antichrist they deny the father and the son yet they claim they believe in the father and the son but they believe the father is the son guess what you are not your own father. You are not. And neither is Jesus. Jesus is not his own father. Oh, well, what didn't Isaiah teach about the everlasting father? He shall be called everlasting father. Okay? He's in the image of his father. But he is not his father. It follows it right up by saying the prince of peace. Well, every prince has a king. Amen? Amen. Amen. The king is the father and the prince is the son. Yeah, you can be a father of a child and you can be the son of another father, but you're not your own father. And anybody that tries to get caught in that is in confusion. And the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. The son, his name is Jesus Christ. And he says that because Jesus died and rose from the dead, when you come under the authority of the son, you also come under the authority of the father and of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So anybody that tries to divide these scriptures is causing division. For a house divided against itself cannot stand. But if you want to sit here and tell me that the apostles, what they say is above what Jesus said. No, what they say have to agree with what Jesus said. So Jesus is telling us that all the fullness of the God that is in Jesus bodily. He's talking about the church there. He's talking about all of us being as one, even as the son and the father are, are one. Which is one in the eyes of God, not one in the eyes of how can man describe the triune God. So they try to deny the triunity of him and just want to say he's one. Like you're one. You can't move around. If your body and spirit were separated, your spirit can't go one way while your body's walking on the earth doing something else. No. 
That's not how it is. But the Father and Son are two. And the Holy Ghost makes three. And the three make one. Like one First John 5 and 7 says, what some people say don't belong in the scripture, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Why in the world would 99.5% of the script manuscripts, even more of that, have the proper translation of 1 John 5 and 7 in it if it didn't belong in the Bible? So if your Bible don't have the proper translation of 1 John 5 and 7, you already know it's a fake. Just like people who say they believe in Jesus and you see them smoking outside in the church, on the church grounds. Then they want to preach. That's a fake. That's a phony. That's a hypocrite. Don't tell me you have the Holy Spirit and you're out there smoking a cigarette because smoking a cigarette will kill you. And God says, do not defile your temple. Understand? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Whosoever defileth his temple, the Bible says, God shall destroy. God will destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? Do you understand? We're talking about a holy gospel. You have to obey. If God hates drunkenness, then why would God want you drinking, knowing that once you get a taste of that whiskey and that wine and that beer, that you're going to want more and more and more? Why would God do that? Here, taste some. Now stop. doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. We're in a generation full of people who are drunkards. We're in a generation full of people who are on a nicotine high. Now they got e-cigarettes. So they're all, they're vaping. You understand? So you, I mean, people just continually devise more and more evil. We have sexual sin running rampant. We have people slandering people and destroying their character. <coughs> we have that running rampant. You understand? There's so many things going, going on. But Jesus told us to observe. What did Jesus say do? Jesus said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled these are the things that jesus taught jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law but he came to fulfill it he fulfilled it so now jots and tittles have passed away because jesus fulfilled it unless you want to go back under the law then you're under the whole jot and tittle of the whole law, if that's how you want to be. And if you want to do that, you have fallen from grace. Paul says that. So Jesus told us that we live under a higher standard than the law. The law simply said, thou shalt not kill. Jesus said, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment. You understand? Jesus told us what it's really talking about. So there's no more excuse. The law said, don't commit adultery. Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust to lust after her, you've committed adultery already in your heart. You're already guilty. So they realized they couldn't keep it without God on the inside of them. If God's on the inside of you and you start lusting after another woman, the Holy Ghost is going to convict you. If God is on the inside of you and you're smoking cigarettes, the Holy Ghost will convict you. He's not going to let you smoke cigarettes in ignorance. There's a warning right on the pack that tells you that it's hazardous to your health. So you smoking cigarettes and you say you believe in Jesus, God can forgive you for smoking for cigarettes, but you better repent. You better stop smoking. You better stop drinking. You better stop doing those things that feel good to your flesh because flesh ain't going to stop with just one. Flesh want more and more and more. And when you try to withdraw, flesh gets angry and flesh rebels because you're withdrawing from that which your flesh wants. That's why people go through withdrawal. That's why people shake violently after years of drinking. That's why people have to go into detox. And when they come out, their mind still wants to go back to that that they got detoxified from. You understand? Sin can ruin your life. Sin can ruin your relationship. How many marriages are torn apart, whether they got divorced or not? If you got, if you committed adultery, you've invited somebody else into your bedroom, and now you're connected to all these soul ties. Even if you are forgiven by the spouse who was devastated by your adultery, you have still 
defiled your marriage. What a serious, serious thing to do. God can forgive you 100%.